Hi, everybody. Um, we've got Wayne here in, in Colorado, and I got Stephanie sitting with me across from me, and Mark is in Madison at the airport, and he's got the same thing he had, I don't know, several weeks ago, where he's not plugged in, and he's sitting in a corner, and um, maybe he'll flash for us for a minute just to show us where he's at at some point. But uh, but it's getting hot, and he doesn't want to use that. There he is, um, Co. so he'll let him look for just a second, and we'll have him let him take his webcam off um, because his computer's getting hot, and we don't want his battery to go dead because all he has is a, is a European cord with him right now. So um, I'm going to just turn it over to him. Everybody knows the drill. Some of you are new. Um, at the end of this, we'll talk more about sort of all kinds of other things. We have a brand new webinar we're doing tomorrow. I just want to mention that. You can go on to uh, onto the uh, Teams site in the morning. We haven't put it up yet, but it, we're, we're starting a new section on alternative health concepts. Mike Warren, who's actually on with us tonight, when we finish at the end, I'll probably let him say a couple words. And I'll just turn it over to, uh, to Mark now. And by the way, just one last thing. Before I go to Mark, if you're brand new tonight, and you have not yet gotten an invitation to get on the Economic Action Team website, so you can watch replays of this, and you can be a member of our team, and you can find all about it, you're going to get an invite tomorrow. So don't, don't get freaked out about it. You probably don't have one yet. And you're going to go in and watch replays, and we'll, we'll talk about that more later. All yours, Mark. Go for it. Okay, so uh, especially for those of you guys who are new, uh, we are, of course, going through uh, a uh, who knows how many weeks it's going to take us to go through a forest ecology curriculum here. Um, this is uh, basically the college level forest ecology curriculum. In part I'm doing it because, uh, in a response to the fact that there's so much in the permaculture movement that uh, you know, on one hand I think is pure dog. Uh, other language that I would use is bullshit. It's just not true. It's just stuff that's repeated over and over again by people who go to a permaculture course, get excited, get trained, and go repeat the same stuff and don't actually live this. Well, as a trained ecologist, for one, and as a person who's been deriving my livelihood for the past 30 years, uh, living with ecological systems, I felt that it's critical as us as land managers, perennial agriculture land managers, to understand the ecology of what we're dealing with here, because that's what it's all about. Um, ha, now why wouldn't that happen? There we go. I first got excited, of course, about uh, a per permanent agriculture. Look at this, tree crops, J. Russell Smith, written in 1926. In his day, 50% of all uh, annual grains in the U.S. and legumes were fed to livestock. Now it's even worse. It's pushing 90% of all of our annual grains and legumes are fed to livestock. We'll talk a little bit about the trophic levels uh, tonight. Um, so most of that food, 90%, up to 90% of that, the grains and legumes, 90% of the calories are not available to human beings because they're utilized as uh, metabolism, the heat of metabolism in livestock. Uh, so he proposed having an overstory of uh, seed and fruit growing trees that drop their food to the ground that the animals eat because a pig doesn't care if it's eating honey locust. You might. I've had honey locust pancakes. We used to eat them quite a bit and they're rather odd. The new selaginous, one of my favorite words. Um, permaculture, this is, this is the book that changed my life. Uh, what I thought was fascinating about it, it's some 600 pages long. Uh, Bill Mollison was from the semi-tropics, subtropics, and all that kind of stuff. And beautiful design framework. How do we design human habitats so that we can actually live on this planet perennially, perpetually, forever? But what really bothered me is his chapter. He only had one chapter on cold climates. It is like 20 or 30 pages, and half of it was simply quite just not true <laughs> because he didn't have any experience there. So my entire past 30 years since I was trained in permaculture has been living the cold seasons permaculture, uh, perennial agriculture lifestyle. My uh, food has come from those type systems. Uh, and my economic livelihood has, has been derived from living on a farm uh, according to ecological principles. The phrase that turned my life around, of course, permaculture is this ecological design methodology um, where we create all these different relationships that we, we, we optimize the, the function and yield within a system. We're not going to maximize the yields, 
but we're going to try to optimize the whole system, not the individual pieces, but optimize the whole system. That's our whole goal as land managers, as people living on this planet, is to how do we optimize these ecological systems that we that we have put in the ground? You get a piece of you know bare black dirt in Iowa or tan dirt in Colorado, wherever you're from, or red dirt in Africa or Haiti. How do we design a system that feeds us, feeds our neighbors, has a surplus that we can exchange with friends, we can sell for for income, uh, other things like you know industrial materials. Uh, fiber, ropes, cloth, building materials, firewood, etc. How do we design these systems so we create systems that are ecologically sound, economically profitable. That's what ecolonomics is all about. Ecologically, ecological economics, ecolonomics. Uh, out of the permaculture uh, designer's manual, apologize for the flight announcements in the background at the airport. Um, Bill Mollison's original sidekick was David Holmgren. Uh, the the uh, the framework of permaculture is unfolded on the ground by certain principles and these are listed right here. The first one's listed in, in this book right here by Holmgren and it starts with observe nature, imitate those systems and then interact with them. So what I figure is like if, if you can't learn how to observe nature, imitate nature and interact with it, you have no business going further on down the line. We gotta, we gotta deal with the priority first but the white zone is for loading and unloading only. If you have to load or unload, go to the white zone. Apologies for the airport. So after you know 30 years of living this way, I got frustrated with the permaculture movement, wrote a book, Restoration Agriculture, and it's real world permaculture for farmers. It's real world in that what we're doing is we're living with the actual observable phenomena of this planet, how this planet works. It's permaculture because we're designing perennial uh, agriculture that's ecologically sound and economically profitable and for farmers because if you actually grow plants and animals for consumption and then you have a surplus that you exchange somehow you're called a farmer. Uh, this book has been translated so far into three different languages and I just got out of my 75,000 uh, email messages that I got while I was uh, over in Africa I just learned today that uh, the contract has been signed and this is now going to be translated into Spanish, which I think is even more significant than English because at least in the U.S. there are more people in agriculture who speak Spanish than there are who speak English. And then if you consider Central America, South America, uh, Europe, uh, I think the Spanish version of this is going to be uh, a pretty big seller. So forest ecology, we need to understand how these woody perennial systems operate. Forest ecology is the scientific study of these patterns, processes, the plants and the animals of forest ecosystems. Now forest ecosystems, according to the ecologists, is a lot looser than, than most people might think. Uh, the concept of a forest, most people think of closed canopy, the woods, you know, deep dark woods, there's a path in the woods, etc., all that kind of stuff. Um, well, a forest, forest ecology is anything that has any kind of woody plants in it. These woody plants might only be two inches tall, it might be one per hundred acres, it might be a closed canopy forest with a path through the woods. Um, that's all forest ecology. Terrestrial systems follow the same rules of terrestrial systems no matter where you are around the planet. Aquatic systems follow the same um, rules of any aquatic systems around the planet. They're just different based on the site conditions. The biotic components, the living creatures, and the abiotic factors, you know, the, the basic bedrock, the soil, um, the weather, the climate, rainfall pattern, all that kind of stuff. So we're studying forest ecology. How, how do these systems operate on this planet? Now how do we imitate that unless we understand how it operates? So we're going through step by step uh, and for the past uh, three weeks anyways we've been talking about disturbances, which we'll get to. We have to understand these ecological processes so we can interact with them. And what we've got a picture of here, this is me and a sidekick, Seth Armstrong, and we're planting trees. Well, you know, you can go ahead and plant trees, apple trees or walnut trees or whatever, and look at all of the research that's been done at the university, and you plant this monoculture of, of trees, and it's like walnuts and grass. I and mean, then you've got to kill the grass because grass is bad, and now you've got a walnut orchard. 
Well, then all of a sudden, nature does what nature does, and it, and it, and it is. Nature is. Pests and diseases are. Rainfall patterns are. Temperatures, wind, all this kind of stuff actually is. But if you have this concept of orchard in your mind, that this orchard has to be this way, as soon as the first bug comes in, it interferes with your stupid idea called orchard. So now you have a problem, and then you have to solve that problem by spending money or spending labor to fight against reality. Well, if we understand how forest ecology works, how the process of succession works, how disturbance works, how the soil biota works, how all these different um, processes interact with one another, if we understand, if we've observed, and we understand how these systems work, our life becomes a lot easier because we don't fight against reality, we work with it, we go with the flow. Um, actually, I watched a little bit on the Olympics tonight when I was stranded at the airport uh, on the whitewater kayaking. You can take a kayak upstream in a whitewater river by hardly paddling. If you know how the currents and the flows move, there's all these back eddies that will pull you upstream and you can just like put your boat into the right little spots and you can go upstream without too much work. So what we're going to do is we're going to manage ecological systems in such a way that people think that we're paddling upstream. So I've been doing the impossible for the past you know 30 years of my life and people keep shaking their heads. It's like well how are you still around because none of your techniques or methods jive with what we're told that we're supposed to do. It's like, yeah, because I'm jiving with what nature tells me I actually should be doing. <laughs> but that's a different story. So if you want to plant trees, um, there was a, a one guy actually just contacted me a couple days ago. Um, he was at a course that I was teaching. And he's like, oh yeah, we're going big time. We're going to get huge here. We're going to plant 250 trees this year. And it's like, you missed the point. How much food do you need? How much food do your animals need? How much uh, food does each one of those trees, shrubs, bushes, or vine provide? Do the math. You don't need 250 trees. You know, maybe you need 2,500 trees. Well, then if you want to pay your bills, pay for the trees that you got, uh, maybe you need 25,000 trees. Well, oh my goodness, how can we do that? Because you have to dig a $40 hole to plant a $10 tree. Now, trees want to live, shrubs want to live, slap them in the ground. This guy right here, when, when we did this site right here, this is approximately 3,000 trees we did it in about two hours. Um, he was only 14. So if you, can't, if you can't wrap your minds around, this is the reality of what, what these folks need in order to have a certain amount of income, have a certain amount of food. So now that they've done this, it's going to behave a certain way. If we try to treat it like an orchard, we will be fighting against pests, we'll be fighting against diseases, we're going to be fighting against quote unquote weeds for the rest of our lives. If we treat this as an ecology, which it is, we now are going to understand how this ecology is going to move through time and we will interact with this ecology the way that nature would, but we're going to do it in such a way as to provide ourselves with our needs and a surplus for exchange and sale. So now ecosystem change occurring through uh, a short period of time, like decades to centuries. <laughs> How many centuries are you going to live? That's a short period of time. Um, change in species composition, the shape, and uh, you know, tall trees, short, medium, starting like with this little field right here with these little crazy patterns on it. Give it 50 years, it's going to be different than this if we're going to be playing the ecological game. In 100 years, it's going to be different than this. In 200 years, it's going to be different than this. Um, that is the process of succession, this change through time, short term, 100 years or so. And uh, this is just a picture of uh, my farm, New Forest Farm, southwest Wisconsin. I believe this was 1996. Uh, this was all a cornfield when we first uh, purchased it. We uh, uh, signed a contract in 94, moved on to it in 95. Uh, so this is 96. And look right here, this little teeny tiny tree. You guys see my cursor, a little tiny tree? Tell me when if you do. So this whole hill right here was planted to trees. A few years later, it looks like this. There's now a house there. Lo and behold, look on the opposite hill. There's a field of, of produce, a field of small grains, produce, small grains, produce, small grains. And in between, the line between the produce and the small grains, excuse my hiccups, there's a row of trees planted right along there, right along there. This is 
a, a, a new planted forest, new forest, that's why it's called New Forest Farm. And it will go through logical, rational, explainable, understandable changes through time with the beautiful uh, subtle randomness that nature happens to throw at you every once in a while. A few more years go by. Mark, do you know this? Yes, sir. Mark, do you, do you see your cursor? And when you, when you get background noise, we barely hear it. So just keep going. Okay, keep going. okay what I'll do is I'll, I, I can put the mic real close. So as oh, time no. goes on. There's background noise. We don't hardly hear it. You don't even have to worry oh, about it. Okay. Oh, good. So as time goes on, new buildings show up because we've got more resources as time goes on. The trees keep growing. Now here's an interesting thing. A lot of people, oh yeah, I'm going to build this, I'm going to build that, I'm going to build this, going to build that. I'll get around with the trees because trees take a long time. Well, you know what? That's exactly why you get to get, got to get around with the trees first. You've got to plant the things that are going to take the longest to mature. Plant those first. Get those trees in the ground, the walnuts, the pines, the hickories, the oaks, whatever it is that, that's going to take a long time to mature, get it in first. Like a building over here, you can get that thing put up in 30 days. You just sign a contract and go to the bank, get a loan and sign a check. You get a building up in 30 days. You can't get a 30-year-old tree in 30 days. You've got to plant it 30 years ago. So that's the old saying, the best time to plant a tree was 30 years ago. The second best time is right now. Uh, these are Korean pines. These are part of the original, my original um, uh, variety trials for pine nuts. And notice there are none in the foreground, but here in the background we've got these are the original Korean pines that survived. And we see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven years old. This is a seven-year-old Korean pine. We'll talk about tree physiology later, and it's already got nuts on it, got the cones on it. This one also over here, there's a couple there. Do -do -do. Then a few more years, wow, you can't even see the house anymore. It looks like a pine forest. These changes that happen through time, succession is, is a very understandable, it's a very known phenomena. You can go do this right here. You can go something like this. And you know, you just know that in 15 years it's going to look like that because you put the species in place where you wanted them to. They're all part of a, uh, a plant community that is natural native to your area. You may have chosen slightly individual uh, species or varieties within that species, but the genus, the gene, is it genus, genera, gen genera, are are native uh, to your particular biome. That's in my perspective. The radical difference between restoration agriculture and most permaculture is the fact that in restoration agriculture, we're going to imitate the natural plant communities of our area because they have been growing there for zillennia without any human care whatsoever. And that's probably our best chance of success for a zero-cost system. This particular system right here has been producing rose hips uh, and mushrooms and pine nuts for a dozen years at zero cost. So if you have zero inputs and you harvest a dollar, that's an incalculable rate of return because you, you're just making so much more than your original investment uh, in that system. And that is, that is some mathematical power that many people still don't believe and they poo-poo, uh, but that's been the reason why we've been able to, to survive here and thrive here for the past 20 plus years. Okay, so the successional pathway of your area is, is known. That will determine a crop mix and where we're located in succession here. And it's not just one way it ends. This is all you have to this is the only way you can describe it graphically, really. It's kind of cyclical. It can kind of go through from bare dirt, rocks, lichens, mosses, small herbs. At some point in time, there is a disturbance that sets it back. <coughs> and then the pathway starts again. And then a disturbance, and then a disturbance, and a disturbance. Disturbance will, uh, will determine which plants are left behind, uh, which uh, young plants are favored. New sites are going to be become available for additional plants, uh, and so we interact with our site, and we have affect the the successional pathway of our place through disturbance. We've talked about wind. We've talked a little bit about fire. I'll talk a lot more to, more about that in uh, future webinars. Um, but ecologists and foresters foresters define disturbance as something. It's a discrete observable event, like I said, fire or windstorm, tornado, ice, uh, herd of bison, 
it changes the ecosystem, it changes their structure, maybe it tears down big trees, maybe it removes shrubs, maybe it burns off grasses, and it changes the species composition. Maybe there was an even spread of, say, a dozen species now, then after this particular disturbance event, a volcano blows up. Maybe there's only five of those original ten species left. They dominate the site and a new successional pathway happens. So disturbance is some kind of event that will change that composition. Now think about that. If you've got this system that you've either planted or it's a natural system that is in your backyard or on a back 40, you now know that if I go in here and I disturb this system, what are my long-term goals? What do I want to accomplish? Food, fuel, medicine, fiber, uh, economy. Well, now, which species are most likely to provide that? Now, how do I disturb this site so that my preferred species dominate the site and thrive and live healthier? And that's how we use disturbance uh, as a way to interact with our, with our uh, system. All kinds of different definitions of disturbance you can go on, but disturbance is natural. And I just wanted to show this picture. I've shown it quite a few times. A lot of people say, oh, it's deforestation. Well, no, that's not deforestation. That is a massive disturbance event that uh, short term wiped out the, the forest that was there. However, this is on national forest land and it uh, either has a seed bank that's available or it's being replanted to forest trees and it's not going to be disturbed for another 75 to 100 years. This is a forest. This is, uh, uh, this is a stage in forest development, this is a successional phase in forestry. Now annual agriculture on the other hand, that's, that's radically different if you ask me. So you, you took a, an intact ecosystem, you eradicate what was there, massive disturbance, so you cut down the trees, you plow up the ground, or you just plow up the prairie, that's a, a disturbance event. Well then if you plow it every single year, you keep arresting disturbance, or if you use herbicide every single year, you keep you know, you keep arresting succession, excuse me, you disturb it every single year and keep it in that annual plants phase, that's deforestation because you're never letting the forest come back. You're never letting any woody plants come back. So uh, disturbance affects the physical site. It creates new landforms. We talked last week quite a bit about uh, the pit and mound uh, micro um, landforms, microarchitecture. Uh, it rearranges the parent material. It, it blasts apart rock, mudslides, landslides, uh, floods, siltation, and that changes the soil properties. Uh, pit and mound, if you remember, the tree falls over, and the root ball, the root plate is what they call it in uh, ecological terms. It, it tears up, so there's organic matter, there's roots, and then there's rocks and soil all mixed together. Then it slowly settles and decomposes. It's a mixing of the, of the mineral soil with the organic matter. When you mix it like that, you introduce more oxygen to it. There's more oxidation happening in the minerals. Uh, a certain amount of tillage, pit mound architecture, is tillage, disturbing that soil. Actually helps to create a healthy soil. What is the right amount for your particular place? That's something that we've got to learn through time. Uh, creates new landforms, pits and mounds and hills, uh, sand dunes, deposits, sediments. Um, it changes the light and temperature regimes. If you look at this picture here, look at how dense these pines are in the background. <clears throat> and you see where the cows are out front. You look at all the dead woody debris on the ground. Uh, I went through here and I slaughtered uh, quite a few uh, black locusts. And I'm in the process of slaughtering probably 40 to 50 percent of these pines in here to get more sun in there. Because these guys right here, little cowies eating grassy and stuff like that. Um, you can actually buy a $500 uh, beef steer in the spring and it gains three pounds a day through the, through the summer and through the fall and then you sell it, you know, October or so, it's gained, well it's 180, 180 days times three, it's gained a you know, thousand pounds of weight uh, if you're getting two, three bucks a pound, you just made two thousand dollars and it didn't cost you a penny to let the sun hit the ground and grow grass and feed a cow. Um, so uh, that's what we're favoring here is we're favoring the sun coming through uh, to keep that grassy component alive and selecting our trees that produce the most nuts earlier in their lives, etc. So all of these uh, disturbances that changes the light, the temperature, obviously when the sun is shining on the ground it's going to be hotter than if there was no sun. <clears throat> um, you know, any kind of deposits 
I do lots of swales and berms, a lot of ponds. Look at all the organic matter, the debris that's on the ground here. We have drastically disturbed the site. Cut a lot of trees, drop it. The decomposition rate is going to go way up, sky high, because now there's all this wood that's getting de decomposed. Then we go ahead and we graze it with cattle, so this grass it tries to grow. It's sloughing off roots, and then we're putting all kinds of manure and urine on the soil. We've drastically changed the biota of this place while making a couple of bucks. Harvesting some firewood, inoculating some sticks with mushrooms. We got mushrooms, firewood, um, cows, fertile soil. We turned red clay into uh, black topsoil. So tonight we're going to talk, you know, we've talked already about uh, wind, a little bit on fire. Now tonight we're going to talk about amidals. I like amidals. They're really fun. They're cute. These are, this is summer, um, this summer's guys here. <clears throat> Animals qualify as a disturbance because they change the biota, they change the structure, they change the function, they change how this ecosystem works. And to understand a little bit what animals do and how they interact with your system, you can just have a little understanding in your mind, well, how am I going to use these guys to create food, fuel, medicine, fiber? To how do I use animals to optimize uh, the function in my, uh, my ecosystem? So that's what we'll be talking about tonight. And just coincidentally and conveniently, I happen to have literally, within a half hour ago, have gotten back from a trip to Africa. And uh, uh, part of what I did this time, it, it happened somewhat uh, at the last minute. Um, and you never know when it's going to happen. But uh, you've seen it probably on National Geographic movies and all that kind of stuff. The great wildebeest migration uh, that occurs in the Masai Mara Game Preserve, the Serengeti, Goro Goro Crater, was going through right nearby where I was. And it's uh, 17 million, 17 million wildebeests that go through this narrow valley in a matter of a, a few weeks. <clears throat> and so this is the um, Goro Goro Crater in, uh, in the border between Tanzania and Kenya. It's, this is an old volcanic uh, cone. It collapsed on itself. It's a caldera, actually. What's interesting about the populations in here is they don't migrate. The ones on the other side of these mountains here, they're the ones that migrate. And they kind of migrate around the outside from the Maasai Mara down to Turangiri, over to Serengeti, the back end of Maasai Mara, and around and around and around and around. Uh, and so there are two different things here. We've got, we've got animals that can move away from their, uh, their food source after they deplete it or whatever motivates them to move. And then we've got other animals that can't get out. And in here, uh, almost all of the African, you know, big African wildlife except uh, giraffes. There's no giraffes in the crater here. They can't get out because the, 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 the sides of the cone are so steep they can't get out. So this is disturbed differently. This has high levels of animals impacting it almost continuously, and they, they move around, sure, where the feed is the best, but they can't like disappear for a year. Whereas the Maasai Mara, Terengiri, Serengeti, uh, the animals will be there for several months, and then they go away. They don't come back for a year. Two different ways to graze your animals. I'm not saying one is right, one is wrong, one is better, one is worse. They're different ways. How do you want to use animals on your system? Just think about what they do. <clears throat> so when we're looking at our systems, we need to think about the energy flow. We've got, we've got uh, plants growing. They're the initial solar panels here. They, they capture the sunshine. <clears throat> so if you think of the amount of sunshine that falls on your place with natural variations, whether you're in a, you know, a, a place that only gets two days of rain a year, a place that's cloudy all the time. I just came from Dublin um, this morning, and I had like a pint of Guinness on Irish soil, gray, cloudy, drizzly, cool, 50 degrees Fahrenheit most of the time. That's a totally different amount of sunlight, different quality of sunlight that strikes the plants. There's only so many dollars worth of sunlight that hits those plants. Whereas in Arizona, for example, there's 367 days worth of sunshine down there. There's a total amount of sunshine is way off the charts, more than that. But already we see the difference between the two is we've got more water over here. In Ireland, for example, better plant growth, less water in Arizona, less plant growth. 
So we've got a, a total amount of cash coming in, of dollars, sunshine coming in. Uh, if we take some of that sunshine and we use herbivores, which are animals that eat plants, uh, some of that sunshine that struck those plants is not available for the plants to grow or to reproduce, which, which can be extremely significant. If you go back here, look at this, look at all this stuff right here. You can take so much green, so much solar energy away from a plant that it will not be able to survive. It will die. It will not uh, reproduce. Its roots won't go down very deep. So if your roots aren't going down very deep, there's not all this injection of carbon into the soil. So you don't build the soil as deep. So already just by describing what I did just then in the past five seconds, you got like 50 million different options. What do you want to do? Are you on a dry site, uh, wet site, cloudy site, sunny site, hot site, cool site? Uh, do you want to focus on uh, building a deep, incredibly deep, rich chocolate cake kind of soil? If that's the case, you might want to grow your plants bigger and not graze them off as much. So the amount of, of uh, green that you actually remove, of plant material that you remove with herbivores, has a direct effect. You've disturbed those plants. How you disturb those plants will determine how those plants affect the site. It will determine which plants thrive and which plants don't thrive. So you're, you're affecting the, 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 uh, the species composition and you're, you're affecting the function within that system. <clears throat> now, if you don't have herbivores, and this is actually kind of significant here because um, uh, I've done a, a one different um, course with uh, vegetarian vegan community. I'm going to be doing another one this fall. The one this fall is different than the one I did before. The one I did before had no animals. No animals, they say. Well, you do have animals because you got all the soil life and all the micro stuff and wildlife. Um, but this this other one I'm going to be doing this fall. They they uh, they take um, domestic livestock and they bring them to their farm and let them live out their their old age. So even though they're not eating the animals, they still have the animals on the ground. But if you don't have herbivores, grazing animals, pigs, cows, chickens, sheep, etc., uh, most of the energy of those plants goes into the decomposition cycle. So you have a lot more fungus, uh, fungal stuff going on. And we're not going to uh, talk a lot about this, but the one thing that I just want to bring in, because I end up saying words sometimes that you might not always follow unless you've heard them before, but detritus. It's like debris, so, so in, in ecological terms, the whole uh, detritus food chain, detrital food chain, or detrital, however people pronounce it, uh, is what is the organic matter falls to the ground, decomposes, or it falls in the water, decomposes, and these are some of the organisms that, uh, that do the decomposition. We can farm these things. This is a lion's mane mushroom right here. This is a very valuable uh, commodity and it tastes delicious. Oh my gosh, if you want to have a really supersonic seafood uh, uh, chowder, you get like four or five of these little lion's manes, you toss them in with a bunch of milk and butter and salt and pepper, and it tastes like seafood. It's great, really delicious stuff. <clears throat> now, herbivores, they're the primary consumers. You, gotta, you have to understand that the plants are producers. They're autotrophs. They take uh, energy from their environment and they uh, support themselves just by passively uh, taking energy from their environment. Well then those producers that produce biomass are consumed by primary consumers. Well primary consumers like cattle and sheep and pigs and chickens and ducks uh, can be eaten by other consumers. These are secondary consumers. This is predation. And so uh, like I said, I was in Africa these past a couple of weeks here, and these are actual factual photographs. I'll tell you when I didn't actually take the photographs. These are photographs uh, in Masai Mara uh, Game Preserve, and yes, I did see a number of kitty cats. So these little kitty cats right here, they're gnawing on something. It's actually these guys right here, and the reason why it's so grainy is because my cell phone will only take it like that, and I zoom in on it, and it got like so grainy. And uh, I'll tell you the story about this fellow right here. It's the first time I've ever seen a cheetah in my life. It's pretty cool. It was really amazing with, with the amount of wildlife that was there at the time because of the migration. The uh, big cats were extraordinarily lazy because they're well fed. If you can imagine eating like 55 barrels of popcorn at the movies, you don't really want to move very far. 
So one of the things about you know the, the the ecology of our place, we have to consider we're landowners or we're land managers if we don't necessarily own the land, is is we have to figure out how to optimize the interception and conversion of sunlight, where we turn it into biomass and we turn it into root matter in the soil, which turns into rich soil, or we turn it into herbivores. And grazers are playing this balance game all the time because in, in a lot of their thinking is how can I raise as many pounds of beef, pork, sheep, whatever, per acre? Well, you can raise this many per acre, but you can't do this all the time because you're going to degrade your resource base. So uh, how do you optimize the functioning of the system? How many animals do I have there? For how long do I have them there? Uh, what effects will those animals have on the system? Um, and how can I make sure that my my forage plants, whether they're woody plants or grasses uh, or herbs, how can I make sure that they have enough energy to survive, reproduce, uh, and feed my animals? And yeah, you know what? There are these many freaking wildebeests all over the place. It's just insane. As far as the eye can see, even these little dots up on the hillside, all wildebeests. It's just crazy. And zebras. And, uh, so, well, uh, it took six hours for us to drive to the place, and then we had like a three-hour drive in one afternoon. Then the next morning we got up before sunrise and had like another three-hour drive around um, in the morning. And then of course we had to drive six hours back. But just look at the just look at the animals that were out there. It's a phenomenal amount of wild beasts. So the energy that that uh, our consumers, our grazers, eat, it's not available for plant growth. We turned it into meat and milk and all that kind of or eggs. Uh, that affects the structure and function of the plant communities. Now, s many people have seen like a grazing system where somebody had their animals out there and they've got to graze down as close as can be and that, that all that's left behind is a whole bunch of clumps of thistles. You've affected the structure and the function of that plant community. The grasses are barely growing and the thistles are dominating. That's not the animal's fault. There's so many people I've heard over and over again, oh yeah, animals overgrazing, animals overgrazing. It's not the animal's fault. It's the management of those animals that's at fault. That was a human being that caused that either ecosystem degradation or ecosystem aggradation. And we, it's our job as restoration agriculture, farmers, ranchers, etc., is to manage our ecosystems so that we have some kind of balance. We're paying our bills, we're producing you know, our food, fuels, medicines, and fibers, our economy, and we're also maintaining the overall health uh, and stability of our ecosystem. Um, now, I, I talked about a little bit about this early, that, that uh, the energy conversion process when an animal eats something it's not 100% efficient. If you ate 10 calories and you turned it into 10 calories of meat and muscle, uh, that would be 100% efficient. It's not like that at all. Uh, my book I wrote about, like with uh, beef, it's approximately uh, 10 pounds of, of annual grains and legumes to make one pound of beef. So it's only 10% efficient. So every time you go between trophic le levels, excuse my hiccups again, a cow eats grass, and only 10% of that grass becomes, it, it will, only 10% of that total amount that it eats is meat, weighted meat. Well, then if you feed that to a lion, um, it's probably not 10, but it's, let's say it's 10%. Only 10% of that uh, becomes lion flesh. So if you eat lions, you're actually eating, if you eat a pound of lion, you're actually eating uh, 100 pounds of uh, grass. Did I do the math right on that? I think so. So every time you go up a different trophic level, that's why eating lower on the food chain is uh, a lot more ecologically sound in that you're eating the plants directly um, and the, that 90% that's turned into metabolic heat is turned into your metabolic heat, not into a cow's metabolic heat, and then, then you just eat that one pound of beef on the cow. So you just have to understand trophic levels. There's a producer level, consumer level, secondary consumer level, tertiary, and so on and so on. Now, there's different kinds of animals disturb, dis, animal disturbance. They all affect ecosystems differently. And one of those is browsing. Um, on the second day that we were there, this would have been a, well, this past Sunday morning, um, we're parked waiting for the sunrise, and lo and behold, the sun rises, and out of these trees over here 
came 25 little elephants, well, little elephants. It was a big old grandma, I don't know where she was, three or four little babies, and look where they all are. They're hanging out at the trees. They're eating the bushes, they're eating the shrubs. When animals eat uh, shrubs or trees, that's browsing. If they're eating grasses, that's grazing. Um, when you set up a grazing system, browsing system on your farm, if you say, oh yeah, I'm grazing cows, and then all of a sudden you see cows eating your trees, you might go, oh no, you know, they're eating my trees and they kill the trees. Like, well, time out. No, no, they're just being animals. What you need to do is understand the difference between the browsing and the grazing, when they browse, when they graze, why do they browse, what are the effects of the browsing? Is, are those effects acceptable for your management practices? Are they actually perhaps performing some kind of helpful service? One of the things with elephants is um, it's been shown over and over again that they're the ones that maintain this savanna. If it wasn't for these elephants um, browsing down the trees and the shrubs, ripping them right out of the ground, knocking them over, more and more woody plants would get established here, and pretty soon there wouldn't be any grass for the wildebeests and zebras and all that, and it would turn into a forest, a you know, tropical high forest. So browsing is animals eating trees and shrubs and bushes and vines and whatnot. These are cattle on New Forest Farm. These guys are grazing. Uh, these guys over in here are eating the trees. You can obviously see this guy right here. We actually use the animals as a tool. You saw earlier how the uh, cattle were in um, with some of the pine nut pines and uh, black locust. Uh, the trees that these guys are eating are also black locust. This is earlier in the spring. You see all the white flowers and the black locust. Um, afraid to let livestock into my trees. I plant apple trees and will graze for that very first year. And people say, oh, they'll kill all your trees. Well, no, they won't. If you're observing your animals, you're observing the kind of browsing that they're doing on your plants, you manage your animals so that they uh, only help your trees instead of harm your trees. And you can see a lot of evidence in the wild. This is a moose browse on birch. You can see how they've nibbled all the tips down. And so notice how these trees have made it up past browse height. And you know the first branches are coming out up here. That's probably about as high as a, as a moose can reach. And once it gets up that high, it can send out lateral branches. But it, while it's stuck in this stage, it's getting browsed over and over and over again. This guy made it well beyond that. So to observe how the animals interact with your plants, use that as a tool. How can we utilize uh, browse as a feed system for our livestock? Um, a number of years ago, I'll have to, I'll have to dredge up those uh, uh, charts again. Jerry Brunetti and I put together a, a list of a lot of different woody species and their relative feed values as browse for animals. We can use these intentionally, and we use them intentionally on, on our farm as feed for the animals. It, they, we intend to have animals browse on the trees. So if you look here, this, this is one of the things that elephants do, man. They just like tear them down, stand on them, uh, and then eat the tops off of it, snapping branches left and right. This little girl here just like stood right on the tree. <laughs> now we have this pit and mound architecture. There's a pit here that will catch more water, catch more organic matter. Seed will blow in here. You've got new uh, germinating sites for plants. All this will decompose. This is now a mix of mineral soil and organic matter. Oh no, maybe we should revoke her permaculture design certificate because she just plowed the ground. Um, we'll talk a little bit uh, next few slides coming up. Mechanical damage, this is doing it specifically for browsing the leaves here. They also just do a lot of, of damage damage for various different reasons. This is a baobab tree uh, in Terengiri um, National Park. And what, what happens is uh, during the driest season especially, they get really hungry. And they'll take their tusks and they'll just shred the bark off and they eat uh, strips of bark. And um, I don't know if eating the bark qualifies as browsing. I guess it would. Um, incidental browsing. Of course, giraffes, <clears throat> what most people don't realize, the dominant uh, grazers, landscape system grazers in North America were mastodons and mammoths, Colombian mammoth, woolly mammoth, and, uh, and the mastodon. Um, they acted very similar as these guys. They ripped down the trees, and they maintained much of North America as savannas instead of closed canopy forests. In North America, we had two different species of giraffes. 
and that there's three different species of giraffe where I was in Africa, and I, I don't know which kind this was. You, and you can tell by the shape of their, their spots here that, and these guys have white boots, and that was supposed to remind me that it's XYZ species. I don't remember what it is. So three different species of giraffe. Browsing of those of trees. So use that as a tool. Understand that alpacas are going to impact trees in a certain way. Observe how do they impact those trees. How can we actually have trees in the system so that it benefits the alpacas? How can we have alpacas in the, so it benefits the trees? How can we manage our system so it, its uh, function and its yields are optimized for all species involved? <clears throat> Another thing that's actually quite significant uh, with critters, um, this is quite significant uh, also especially for the health of the, uh, of the, uh, of the grass, is trampling. Uh, notice that uh, there's a certain amount, yeah, these look like it's been ripped and grazed off, but so much of it has just been trampled and packed. Trampling of an area uh, is especially significant in drier climates. Uh, what you do when you trample this grass over is that now when rain falls down out of the sky, it doesn't splash on bare soil, but it splashes on a mulch layer. It acts as a mulch layer, and if you put your hand under that mulch layer, it's cooler under there, so the soil surface is cooler. When the soil surface is cooler, it doesn't crust as much, and the next rain is more likely to soak in instead of run off. Uh, plus, uh, and since it's cooler and not 3 million degrees uh, in the sun, the decomposer organisms act faster. If you've ever put mulch out, you give it a couple of months, you know, you just lift it up, you see all the decomposing activity that's going on from the earthworm castings and so on. So the, the trampling is significant, and it protects the soil, uh, also, if you trample, if you trample graze when the grass is green, instead of grazing the grass off short so it's like two inches tall, you trample it so they eat maybe 50% of it and trample the other 50%, the solar panel of that grass plant is now 6, 8, 10, 12 inches long instead of one inch long. The longer the solar panel is on that grass, the quicker it will uh, recover from grazing. Here in, in the uh, Masai Mara, in this case right here, it's uh, you know, well into the dry season, so most of the grass is dead or, or senescent. Senescent isn't necessarily dead, it's just kind of like not functional anymore. Um, the grass plants themselves are alive, but the tops just like drop back. Most of the energy gets sent down to the roots, gets exuded into the soil, and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of carbohydrate um, cellulose and lignans in the grasses. This is a fascinating picture because I all of a sudden I told the driver to stop. I joined another uh, safari group. There's like a total of seven of us. I said, stop right here. And the safari driver is like, what for? I said, well, I want to take a picture of the grass. <coughs> and everybody in the, in the car is like, oh, man, come on. We want to go see the animals. I said, wait, 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 look. And this is trampling. I go off into my big lecture on, oh, look at the trampling here. They, you know, they graze this stuff and these tufts, and they knock this all down, and there's manure in there and all that kind of stuff. Um, but I think what really happened is my eye must have just caught this glimpse. And look at that right there. I did not stop to see that critter. I stopped to look at the grass and the turds on the ground. And this is who just stepped up out of the grass and started walking. And notice all the trampling, good mulching going on. Uh, it doesn't provide as much hiding spots out here for predators. So the predator is hiding in the tall grass. So maybe if you have a lot of predators in your area, you know, wolves or coyotes or, or mountain lions, whatever it is, maybe you do want to graze your grass down lower or at least mob your animals closer and really trample it good so there's not as many hiding spots. <clears throat> now hoof impact. Can you see these little round holes all over the place? Hoof impact is uh, fairly significant in that if it's uh, on green grasses, it kinks, uh, kinks the grass and oftentimes that particular, those blades of grass that have been kinked will die uh, and um, more nutrient is maintained in the tops of that grass because it, it doesn't flow back to the roots so much so it's more nutritious feed uh, for the animals. Also the hoof impact makes firm contact between the, uh, the, the grass and the soil so it'll decompose quicker. It also makes these little micro pits, these little V's, you know, little tiny divots in the ground 
So seed can go into there, water gets micro concentrated in there, so they become these little mini pit and mound from all these little hoofs pounding it into the ground. <clears throat> Oftentimes what, what I do is, uh, and I, I, I did it, um, I'll show them sometime soon, but they're also on my Facebook page. When we have a, a winter cover crop of small grains, I will go ahead and uh, sow white clover or uh, red clover, yellow sweet clover, right into the full mature grain crop. And then I go ahead and I trample graze the animals through there, the cattle go through there, and what they're, I put the seed down first and then send the animals in. And so what they end up doing is I stomp on the ground and it, and it makes full contact between the seed and the soil and have a better germin germination rate of the, uh, of the seed when you do that. So hoofed impact is, does exactly that. Look at all these little hoofy spots. <clears throat> uh, you can notice a couple of significant surprises showing up. We'll talk about this a little bit later. Now, of course, <clears throat> on our farm, um, we're, we're going to want certain outcomes and not want other outcomes. You can see over here that this is uh, significantly impacted here and it's not as set back as this. Maybe what happens, the animals are here for a while, then they moved here, and now they're over there. Um, on my farm, I wouldn't want to see too much of this. This means that I don't have any green going on, and green is what it's all about. We want to capture that sunlight so we can either eat it ourselves, sell it to somebody else, or feed it to these guys and then eat them or sell them. And in the wetter areas, you get a lot of this pugging, and when you have wetter areas with hoofed impact, uh, you can have these compressed layers that, that will uh, cause these micro anaerobic zones and the decomposition cycle will go off into a more uh, anaerobic uh, area which isn't as conducive to growing good rich forage as a very aerobic. Or you can get this nice even blend, a good 50% trample, 50% graze, lots of poops and peas all over the place. I would like to see this on my farm, not necessarily this or this. Um, this looks to me like a very dry situation, and so if this was uh, my farm, uh, I'm, that's not so bad. It, I don't know the circumstances that cause that. <clears throat> here we see here like a little hoof, you know, slide, punch, little step right over here. These little micro disturbances are actually significant. Look how the organic matter has been pounded in the ground here. That stuff's going to decompose quicker. <coughs> like this clover here probably going to set seed. If it hasn't set seed already, give it a couple weeks. The seed falls onto what? Nice bare soil. Now all of a sudden it's got a good root hold there. We get better regeneration of the plants that we want with judicious uh, hoof impact. All right, the good stuff. All the good stuff counts. Here's some of the good stuff right here. <clears throat> like 35 to 75 poops a day out of a cow. Um, look at this too. we got little pergies hanging out on their backs eating all the bugs off of them. Um, how many pounds of phosphorus get you know, pooped onto your soil from birds? More birds, more phosphorus. Uh, more animals, more poop. <clears throat> Other good stuff that's significant are dead animals. <clears throat> this is actually a, a photograph from the Ostvardus Plassen in uh, the Netherlands where I just also just was and there aren't any higher order predators like uh, wolves or bears or, or uh, you know, lions, for example. And so when the animals die, the, uh, most of the, the meat and guts get removed by um, birds of prey, vultures, and uh, rodents. <clears throat> but all of that, if a, if a vulture or a, a hawk, eagle or a mouse nibbles this, what do they do? They go poop and they pee elsewhere, so they take this concentrated source of nutrients and they spread it all out. I find it fascinating, this picture, look at the green right around this carcass, all the nutrients that have just been released by this carcass, and over here it's not so green. <clears throat> I've had places where I've shot a deer during deer season, it fell to the ground and died in that spot and I gutted it. You know, after a couple days, the coyotes take all the guts away, but I've had this green spot that's kind of shaped like a deer laying down that lasted two years once in this one particular spot. So these are very significant nutrients being recycled back into the uh, system. So we've got poop and pee, all of our excrement. Um, drool is some uh, a gal out of University of Wisconsin-Madison who did studies on <clears throat> uh, the response of grasses to grazing and that when you 
when a, a cow pulls on the grass, that tugging, that stretching, elongating, releases a particular hormone that has to do it and it, and it causes the plant to release more sugars into the soil. Uh, then the drool from the animal also sends another chemical signal to the plant to accelerate that sending sugars to the, to the soil, which feeds the soil food web, which in turn poops and pees, which now becomes fertilizer for the grass, so the grass responds better when it's grazed at the appropriate amount. What that appropriate amount is going to be different on a dry site versus a wet site, hot site versus cold site, and it's our job to learn what that is to observe and imitate and interact. <clears throat> now, um, yeah, <laughs> these pictures were actually taken in February. And when I was in uh, Africa in February, I tell you, everybody was doing everybody. Animals uh, reproducing, more animals will have a larger impact than fewer animals. Fewer animals concentrated in the spot will have a pretty significant impact. Uh, a few animals scattered over a wide area will have a different impact than if they were concentrated in a small area, but more total numbers uh, actually have a significant impact on the environment. So animal numbers is another, uh, another uh, ecological disturbance. The fact that there's now going to be another 15 monkeys out there because there's our baboons actually, um, they will eat more, they'll, they'll tear up more plants, the zebras will graze more, <clears throat> etc. Elephants will rip up more trees. And different animals disturb the site differently. Just, just watch. Look at how a duck interacts with its environment versus a chicken. So we got our cows going through here. We have a decent trample, decent graze. This is on New Forest Farm, Wisconsin. And uh, <laughs> it's virtually impossible to keep chickens away from the back end of a cow because when this comes out the back end, uh, some of them like it when it's live and fresh. Some of them wait till later, till when uh, flies have laid eggs in there and the larvae start to grow. So these guys get to eat more larvae. Pigs like it fresh, uh, in part because a lot of the uh, bacteria that are in here that are digesting all this, um, the grass, the cellulose, and the lignans that are in the, in the uh, grazed material here, <clears throat> the pigs will need those bacteria in their guts in order to properly digest that. Pigs are one of them. Uh, elephants are one of them. If you guys want to have some really bizarre uh, YouTube experiences, uh, go online and look for elephant mother feeding her baby poop. Uh, I don't know what you'd search for to find that, but uh, what a mother elephant will do is she'll stick her trunk up the hind end of another elephant, grab a big handful of the good stuff, and shove it down her baby's throat. That's the first food that that kid gets because it absolutely needs those digestive enzymes, bacteria, and whatnot to break down all the coarse debris that they eat. Now what the chickens will do here is they kind of scatter this all out, so now you don't have this hyper green tuft um, that the cows won't eat next year. Obviously pigs. I didn't take this picture. Uh, this is a warthog plowing up the ground. <clears throat> do you want your pigs to root up the ground? If they root up the ground, they're going to create new sites. They're going to mix mineral soil with organic matter soil. Uh, they're going to create new places for seeds to grow. They're going to eat a lot of different grubs and worms and snakes. If you don't want them to, to plow on the ground, you put rings in their noses and they don't plow on the ground. So what are your management decisions? How do you want to use this animal impact to disturb your site in order to accomplish your objectives? And they also affect the system different in different seasons. A moose browsing in the wintertime is going to do it differently than a moose browsing in the summertime. Some of the disturbances direct like this moose eating willows here, and some is in indirect. Uh, like with caribou, caribou eat mostly mosses and lichens, they actually lichens mostly, and what they'll do is they'll, they'll go grab the lichen that's on a branch, break the whole branch off, and eat the whole branch. So they're browsing the tree, but they're really after the lichen. So if some of it is direct, they're after your tree, some of it is they're after the, the lichen that's on your tree. <clears throat> uh, in the different seasons, they'll, they'll interact with your system differently. Not saying one is right, one is the other, one's better or worse. We need to observe how do these animals interact with our system? How do we optimize the function of our system? And of course, structural effects, just plain destroying the trees. I mean, I don't know how many trees I've had ripped apart by a deer just shredding their antlers. Fowl, dust baths, <clears throat> hogs doing rolling in the mud. I tell you what, I, I really would like to. Um, eat a warthog. I like regular 
pigs, and so I imagine Roadhog would be delicious. Stripping the bark off your trees. We already saw the one, the picture of the ele elephant knocking the trees over. Animals will structurally affect your system. Get used to it, figure out how to work with it as a tool. Use your livestock as a specifically uh, understood and designed disturbance in your system. And then, of course, grazing, just a plain old eating of grass. <clears throat> Woke up in the middle of the night, had to go to the bathroom. And I, I thought that I got up because I had to pee really bad. My bladder was super, super full. Get outside of the tent, and I heard this rip, 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 rip. And I stopped, and I paused, and I could see about 30 Cape buffalo that were totally surrounded me. And these are theoretically the toughest, uh, one of the most dangerous animals, them and hippos, on the planet. And that they just, they'll get a wild hair up their nose and decide to stomp all over you and kill you. So I was a little bit freaked out for a while. <clears throat> I just stood there as they looked up at me and they kind of went back to their graves and rip, 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 rip. How many hundreds of pounds of forage does a 3,000 pound animal have to eat in the course of a day to eat a lot of grass? <clears throat> so with, with our grasses in the system, look all these dots in the background. Every single one of these dots are wildebeest. What they'll do is they're going down this valley here over to the right to the Mara River. And if you go on online to YouTube and look up at Mara River, you know, Great Migration, you'll see pictures of these, you know, all these animals running across the river. We went down to the river and waited for like two hours, and all these wildebeest and zebras just piled up on the shore. A couple go in, then they run out. A couple go in, then they run out. And they never just like ran across like I wanted to see in a National Geographic movie. But anyways, your grasses, they, they exude sugars into the soil, and that feeds the soil food web. They also slough roots that die that are now in the, in the soil. So what sugars are, they're carbohydrates, carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. They've taken carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen right out of the atmosphere. They pump it down into the soil. That's how we can get a massive, really rapid turnaround in CO2 levels in the atmosphere is just by managing our grazing better. And by balancing and managing our decay cycle and our grazing cycle, we can we can accelerate uh, the growth of the development of a rich, dark uh, topsoil. We can help turn that, uh, whatever our subsoil is, into a rich, fertile, highly mineralized topsoil. <clears throat> now, what's interesting, now, this is, this is a grazing where these animals come through and that they have a long period of rest. These guys come through, they're here for a few weeks, and they're gone. They'll be back in a year from now. That system has a long time to recover. Whereas here, this is in the Ostpartisplassen in the Netherlands. Um, these, it's like in the um, Goro Goro Crater. Uh, these animals really can't go anywhere. And so they graze the dickens out of it. They've actually uh, turned a willow and elderberry shrubland into this grassland. And what's fascinating, Jeffrey and I were there uh, last December or so, is in this part of the Ostpartisplassen, a full 50% of all of the wild waterfowl in Europe live there. And this was just a, 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 you know, a low spot in a polder where they, they put a dike around it and they drain it all out. They never got around to developing it, so they let it turn into this wild experiment. They let go some uh, heck cattle, some Koenig pony, ponies, red deer, and roe deer, and just turn them loose and let nature, nature take its course with no predators, of course. Um, they've had eagles return that never have been there before, and they've totally converted their shrubland into a grassland. And as, as far as you can see in this place, the tall grass is out in the wetlands where the grazers don't go. But the grass was grazed as close as a golf course green. And the, the uh, uh, biologists that were there said, you know what, we've done the math here, and this is actually uh, started with like the bare mineral soil after they drained it, and, uh, and pumped it, so it was ocean bottom, and then grasses, or the trees and shrubs grew, then the grasses are in there. Well, the organic matter in the soil, the fertility of the soil, uh, has been increasing for the 30 plus years that they've been doing this experiment. So the soil is becoming richer every single year, period. Uh, the amount of meat that they're producing per acre exceeds the amount of meat that they're producing on any commercial farm in all of the Netherlands, period. And know what it costs for them to raise all of the, these animals? Nothing. They just turn them loose and let them do their thing and let the system kind of stabilize. 
It's uh, somewhat, uh, in some circles, it's extremely unpopular, this particular place, because uh, animals do starve and die in the wintertime. Um, but the soil is increasing in fertility, and the amount of uh, pounds of meat per hoof uh, per acre is, is uh, off the charts. This is the most productive meat-producing uh, area in all of the Netherlands. So severe grazing like this ensures that I mean, that great grass is harvested, it is. But it will reduce the plant growth in theory, uh, which will slow down the soil development in theory. But in this case right here, it hasn't. I have seen that overgrazing in drier areas is a significant limiting factor. I mean, you'll just graze the grass all the way and it just disappears. Well, what happens here is when they graze it all the way, the animals disappear because they starve. Um, so if we have a migrating system where we have lots of rest versus a set stocking system where they stay here, what are your goals? Are you going to raise the, as, as much meat as you possibly can? Do you want to build a rich topsoil? Uh, do you want to have a balance between the two? You have to understand your goals and figure out how to use these animals and the disturbance that they produce in order to accomplish those goals. <clears throat> Here's my, uh, my guys right now. I want them to trample and graze. Uh, underneath the walnut trees. They also eliminate the branches here, so there's no branches down low. I still get sunlight going down because I'm growing walnut trees as fast as I can. This is my retirement account, <clears throat> also from seed, etc. So I've got a nice crop of beef growing down low and a nice crop of trees up above. This is a silvo pasture system. Once again, different animals graze differently. Here's a, a mob of chickens. And this is Anna in the milk cow. She was a sweetheart. She'll follow you everywhere. <clears throat> Uh, warthogs down on their knees, pigs once again plowing in the ground versus grazing on top of the ground. Here's my domestic pigs. You know, is there really any difference between having a herd of these pigs running loose doing their thing and a herd of these pigs running around loose doing their thing? Well, these guys, I have to make a decision of when to move them, whereas these guys go wherever they want, whenever they want. Different impact on the system. Also, this is a humid environment, whereas Africa. It's a, uh, the monsoon type area where they'll have a wet season and dry the rest of the year. And there's going to be multiple disturbances, multiple interactions between the disturbances like this one right here. Ice damage could have broken branches which provide infection spike for disease, which weakens the trees, which attracts pests. Um, you know, which of those disturbances really killed the tree? We don't know. We're going to be dealing with, on our property, we're going to be dealing with a number of different disturbances different intensity of disturbance, see the high intensity of disturbance, uh, or infrequent or frequent, all these different things. We have to understand this rolling calculus in our mind uh, and be able to manage these systems through time. And so this is what I wanted to show uh, right now. A lot of you, are, I'm sure, have already seen this because I've presented it a lot. Uh, these are some newly planted chestnut trees um, and we just graze right through it. Notice the hoof impact. We've got some grazing. You can see the, all the grasses that are ripped off. There's some trampling that you see going on here. Every once in a while on your property, you'll do things. Everything will come out right. This came out just about perfect. A good trample, good graze, poop all over the place, pee all over the place. If I could raise trees this way, this is exactly how I would raise them because the animals are making money while you're growing trees. And then pretty soon the trees start making money. When they start, these are chestnut trees. Once again, the physical le legacies <clears throat> are what's left behind after disturbance. What's left behind after this disturbance? The chestnuts. They'll dominate the site. What's left behind after this disturbance? Red pine and white pine. This is wind disturbance. Here again, I went through. I did a disturbance. I cut down black locust and any other trees, and I left the chestnuts behind. I don't have to go back here again Oops, for another 5, 7, 10 years because these chestnuts want to dominate the site. The, the structure and the species composition of this site has changed. And it will now go into a different phase of succession that I need to learn about and understand in order to accomplish my objectives. This I showed a, a couple weeks ago in Maine. I set up this different little uh, system. This was in a clear cut 30 years ago and I planted um, butternuts. These are all butternut trees here. They're way out of their zone. They're like two or three zones north. Um, the legacies that were left behind in this clear cut was a lot of seed, red spruce, uh, birch, beech from stumps and sprouts. When we do a disturbance, there'll be things left behind that are the new 
generation or the new you know genesis of the site and it'll have its own successional pathway now this is I love this this is a guy who lives down the road from me these are Korean nut pines I sold them to him he's got grapes and he grazes sheep three parts to a system is there anything different between that and that is there a difference between this and this this qualifies as permaculture it's permanent agriculture perennial grasses, perennial grapes, perennial trees, I'm a permaculturalist. Uh, is this acting differently than that? I suspect so. When I interact with this site, it's going to be different than when I interact with that site. You choose which one you want. Um, but this is where I'm, I, I've been going with a, a bare black dirt cornfield for the past 20 years. Your goals will determine what kind of disturbances you use and with what intensity. And all of that will determine what you see and, and the labor that, and the expenses that you'll create for yourself. You look at this system again. 90% uh, of the labor in this system he created by the way he planted it and by the way that planting now requires that he, he uh, interacts with it. Whereas this system right here, I have not touched this system in 30 years, kid you not. And this produces as much uh, food per acre as that does at zero cost input so the marginal rate of return is incalculable because there are zero inputs and you get a return whereas this right here you may get top yields on grapes and pine nuts and sheep and all that kind of stuff but the labor cost just eats right into it and keeps them busy I'd rather go fishing so what's your ecological legacy going to be you may inherit or purchase a farm that looks like this what are you going to do with that you're going to grow corn the rest of your life or are you going to do something like this? This is a new forest farm about uh, 15 years into the process. This farm right here looked like this when we first got it in 1995. So what is your ecological legacy going to, go, going to be? And that's what I'll leave it at tonight. Because we're over time and my butt's sore. <laughs> You're sitting there. Uh, <laughs> uh, put your camera up again real quick, Mark. Sorry, buddy, again, where you said. Again, yeah. everybody, this has been awesome, as always. Um, <laughs> you know, so things to think about at the end. Um, you, know, you, you didn't have any other questions yet. A guy said, where, could, where can you buy a herd of elephants? So, yeah. <laughs> I want to do the same thing. I actually have a dream. And Peter, Peter Allen lives down the road from me, Macedon Valley Farms. We have a dream that we want to live long enough to see our granddaughters herding bison while riding on elephants. Uh, that would be cool. <laughs> oh, here's one. I do have one more here. Are there alternatives to elephants for removing woody shrubs? Oh, oh sure. Sure. It's called a chainsaw and a tractor and a, you know, a, a land clearer, a hydro axe, whatever they call those. That's the thing is, is <clears throat> it, I'm not saying that, that we need to use these animals. I'm saying that we have to understand the disturbance that they do and say, okay, well, what is it that wind is doing? What is it that fire is doing? What is it that elephants are doing, what is it the giraffes are doing, and how do I accomplish that uh, while producing a yield? And so, you know, my chainsaw, I, I didn't think it would happen so soon in my life, but basically I manage my system now with a chainsaw. This, this place right here, I just got to keep cutting stuff out of the way, turn it into mushrooms, turn it into, you know, firewood, building materials, uh, forage for the, for the livestock, etc. So chainsaw, tractor, hydro axe, Elephant substitutes. So one more here, and actually this one is kind of for an answer for you, Mark. Um, I'll actually answer it. I think it's Alaz asks about a Skype consultation. Uh, Mark and I are partners here, and we really try to avoid sort of selling on these calls. We'll get back to you, Alaz. Uh, I've got your name here, or um, you can actually email either to Mark or myself, and we'll make sure that we. Uh, we talked to you about that. We'd love yeah, to just be pass, able to mark. pass him off to Jeffrey because Jeffrey's the, the scheduling yeah, guy. Yeah. So that'd be great. Yeah, we'll get that. Um, guys, again, Mark has had an amazingly difficult trip. Let's let's give him some applause <laughs> by ones in our chat section for him here. And then, if you liked it, if this was good tonight, and then um, let's let him let him hit the road and head home. Not that far from home, but he still does have a drive ahead of him. Yeah. And um, again, he'll be back next week. Any questions you have in between now and then, you can put them onto the Economic Action Team site, and we'll deal with them. 
Um, join the Facebook group. Remember, we've got another session starting tomorrow night on alternative health. I teach the session on aquaculture on Mondays. We teach about poultry on Tuesdays. So we're up to four nights a week now, or four days a week starting tomorrow. And we'll keep growing from there. And uh, our goal is to just keep teaching you guys. Again, this will start costing money in not too long. Not for you guys. You guys are here. You're, the, you're going to be the, the foundation for this. You're our leaders, really. But it will start costing new folks coming up in the not too distant future because we're getting lots of members. We're almost over 1,000. We're going to try to hit 1,000 this week. So um, you guys are great. Thank you, Mark. Thanks to the staff. Thanks to Deb and Mark in Bangladesh and to, and to uh, Stephanie. And, um, and then Jeffrey's on here. He's back in the States. He and I are meeting tomorrow, Mark, here in uh, Colorado. So, um, Reach in the crowd, everybody. Live well. Yeah, thanks everybody, and this has been great. We'll talk to everybody in the near future. Bye. Bye now.